Thank you for the invitation, the warm welcome, the opportunity to talk about my hobby horse, and to return the favor ever. Thank you for making this beautiful picture. Um, so indeed, are we on? Yes. I will tell about robots that evolve, learn, and teach each other. And you may or may not have heard my name before. Uh, if you have, then most likely you have heard it because of uh, evolutionary computation. And you may have heard about the textbook that Jim Smith and myself wrote uh, 14 years ago, and two years ago the second edition came out. So if you don't know enough about evolutionary computing, I could recommend this book very warmly. To summarize it very briefly, it's about artificial evolution. And you may even say that this is a contradiction in terms. There is no such thing as artificial evolution. Quoting Daniel Dennett, if you have variation, heredity, selection, and selection, then you must get evolution. Which means that evolution is evolution is evolution. And it could be in wetware, but it could be in software. And it may not make sense to distinguish both. For both holds that you have two uh, main powers or forces, variation, which is pushing the system towards novelty and uh, uh, increased levels of diversity, and selection, which is pushing quality and it reduces diversity in the system. So to contradict myself saying it makes no sense to distinguish artificial evolution and evolution, on the next slide I will, because this represents my research motto. My long-term research motto is Evolution can create intelligence, and we know this for a fact, and you and me are part of the evidence. If this is a known fact, then the second is a very plausible working hypothesis that reads, artificial evolution can create artificial intelligence. So this is how I position the work I do and the work people uh, in my group do uh, with artificial intelligence. That's how we align that. So let's look into the notion of intelligence a little bit. Of course, you can fill books about that too. One important thing behind that is uh, for everybody and everything, human beings, animals, robots, all you know, animated and actuated entities, it holds that the behavior is determined by the environment, the body, and the mind. So all three together determine what happens. And whether that behavior is appropriate or not depends on the level of intelligence. And this tells us that intelligence can be located at different uh, components of the system. In the 20th century, artificial intelligence considered a very, very, very narrow notion of intelligence, strictly restricted to the mind. And in the last decades, this is broadening up, and now we are considering intelligence that is also hosted by the body. So you would have uh, the good old AI and the embodied AI. And this is a no-brainer, it is also something we know already for long, you need body and the mind. You need the hardware and the software if you want to create uh, entities that behave appropriately. You can see this also in the changing ambitions of AI on a very large uh, historical level. The ambitions of artificial intelligence in the 20th century were mainly focusing on thinking machines. And the iconic challenge which AI people wanted to solve before the end of the century, uh, before 2000, was to build a machine that can beat uh, the world champion of chess. And indeed, as you all know, in 1997, this happened. IBM's computer beat the world champion of chess. So this was all about digital intelligence. In the 21st century, this is broadening up, and now we are after embodied intelligence. So rather than simply thinking machines, we are going for acting machines, and even interacting machines. And the corresponding iconic challenge is to build a system which can beat the world champion of football by 2050. And as you all know, there is this RoboCup championship every year, uh, coming up in uh, Japan this year, in uh, late July, early August. And indeed, if I had to bet with my own money, I would definitely bet on the robots in 2050 and not on, on humans. So this is about intelligence and the relevance of having a body around it. Getting back to adaptation or adaption, the different 
systems, different mechanisms, different algorithms uh, that can be called adaptive mechanisms. And uh, Everton, we were part of an EU project called New Ties between 2004 and 2007, and within that project we developed a notion, a conceptual framework, which I very briefly uh, cite here. So adaptation can be divided into evolution and lifetime learning. And lifetime learning, again, can be divided into lifetime learning of an individual that does not require explicit input from others and social learning, which does. Given this taxonomy, we can distinguish uh, also the relevant entities and timescales of this learning thing. So adaptation, the, the role of adaptation in any system is to discover useful traits, knowledge, uh, for unknown situations, situations that were unknown at the time of the design of the system, or changing situations, or unsolvable situations, for which a solution is too hard to develop by the classic uh, analytic means based on mathematics or reasoning. And then we have evolution, which is vertical knowledge transfer, done uh, in the chain of generations, from father to son, or from mother to daughter. Individual learning, there is no knowledge transfer. An individual learns something, the individual uh, will have a better behavior, uh, survive longer, eat more, uh, whatever is necessary. But then, this is a thing. If the individual dies, that knowledge dies with the individual. And this is where social learning comes in. Social learning is horizontal knowledge transfer, not vertical, within the same generation. So it is sharing knowledge. And thereby, it has several advantages. So again, uh, social learning is knowledge sharing and it decreases the learning cost for each individual because if you learn something and you gave, give me that knowledge then I don't have to invest uh, the, the learning effort. I get the result of your learning efforts and we can you know, trade uh, knowledge and then we both benefit. On the system level, this is what Jacqueline mentioned uh, this morning, the learning speed and the performance are increased. So you are, the whole system learns quicker, faster, and uh, the, uh, the behavior will become better. And there are two additional benefits. The second one is robustness slash resilience with respect to knowledge loss. The population acts as a knowledge reservoir. This is very nice to see that this happens in this meerkat. Uh, as you said, uh, some, some habit survives even if the individuals, uh, that, 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 that mother is not there anymore, but even after generations and generations, they still get up early or get up late. There is no one around over a period of time, but the habit is there. So this is the role of a population as being a knowledge as everywhere. And it's also increasing generality, because if we are experiencing different situations in different segments of the environment, then the, the learned knowledge will have a much better base, a bigger data set uh, which it generalizes and from which it learns. More diverse sample behind the knowledge. And now getting back to one of the key issues that comes back uh, in many talks, and it's one of the essential uh, subjects of this uh, gathering, individual learning and social learning can be seen as an evolutionary process where individual learning plays the role of mutation, introducing fresh blood, you know, inventing or discovering new stuff. And social learning disseminates it and it's recombining it. So in my vocabulary, recombination or crossover in an evolutionary algorithm always means that you get a mixture of the, the parental knowledge or traits. Very often, the, the speakers today use social learning almost equivalently with cloning, importing it and not changing it. So in our mindset, uh, the, 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 the default is that you import something and then you integrate it, you combine it with your own thing. So you get something which the sender doesn't have and you don't have, and after making this uh, social learning operator, you will have. And then choosing what to accept is akin to selection. So whom are you listening to? And to what extent are you willing to uh, incorporate knowledge from somebody else? So if you put all this together, you have all the, com uh, all the ingredients from an, of an evolutionary process. If social learning can be seen as an evolutionary system, then 
knowledge that has been developed in evolutionary computing can be used to develop and study and um, analyze these kind of systems. For instance, we know about premature convergence, the loss of uh, diversity, you climb uh, a local optimum, maybe you don't get the global optimum. It's a phenomenon that has been studied, we uh, have a couple of tricks to cope with that. Or bloat, survival of the fattest. If the system allows uh, constructs to grow, then they will grow. This is known in genetic programming, but in all parts of evolution computing where you have variable size data structures. Or pemictic or lo local mating. Uh, this morning I reacted to uh, your talk. Where are you? Yeah, there. Uh, interconnectedness and multimodal adaptive landscape. So this is a piece of knowledge that was readily present in evolution computing and the phenomenon seems to be very similar in uh, the social learning context. So this is about social learning and in our mind these systems imply that every learner is also a teacher because everybody can parent another child, everybody can receive knowledge from others and can send knowledge to others. There is, there is no difference in this respect, also, although Julian is uh, playing around with the idea to use a reputation-based system to, you know, to change this from a flat landscape to some skewed landscape. And as you see here, uh, how does this work? Does it, okay, so what you see here running is our lab in Amsterdam and these are the robots that uh, our project and Jacqueline is working with. So everything she showed in simulation, this is the real thing in, in hardware. And what you see here is they have to learn a task, obstacle avoidance, and of course you know how to program it. We don't want to program it. We want the skill of avoiding obstacles to emerge by social learning slash evolution. And in a few hours or maybe in just in one hour they learn this skill. And this is just a toy setting, of course, but on the right hand side you see a setting which is really serious, which is coming, well maybe it, it is already here, so there are some other machines that can all improve themselves by learning, by doing, improve their parameter settings, uh, uh, learn about their users, and if they exchange this information, then the whole system will be better over time, uh, rather quickly. I have been listening to a talk of the chief technical officer of Honda uh, a couple of months ago and he said, as we all know, uh, driving well uh, requires a lot of hours behind the steering wheel and doing the driving. We know that as a humans and for cars the same will hold and they cannot have enough kilometers or miles being driven by these cars. So one way to boost that is doing this and social learning, uh, introduce social learning in that system. So what this leads to is we are going from machine learning to learning machines. So machine learning is the art of developing the algorithms and if you invert it you get a system where the machines are inherently adaptive, change their behavior over time. There's a lot of technical questions and also a lot of ethical questions, legal questions, what happens if a machine does different things today than uh, it did the, when, when you bought the whole thing. Conceptually, you can put this all together and you will get a little matrix, two by two, depending on what part of that entity is concerned and what kind of adaptive mechanism works. So we distinguish the body or the morphology and the mind or the controller, as we call them in robots, and we have evolution and learning. And in learning we can make a further distinction between individual learning and uh, social learning. Not all combinations make sense, some combinations are very popular, like uh, evolving controllers has been done already for 20 something years. Uh, learning controllers has also been done for quite some years. 2A is something interesting, it's something like, you know, working out in the gym, so you change your own body, you know, you, you can you can grow muscles uh, or you can, you know, lots of things to change on your body. And 2B is an interesting thing, this morning I couldn't come up with anything useful, uh, so it may, uh, may be something that only exists in theory. But this is the big mindset that I could position uh, a lot of what we do. And if you are studying an existing system as a biologist, life on earth, then the decisions have been made already, so you are studying a system that is already there. But when you are doing robotics then you develop 
a system and you make the designer's decisions. So one of the major decisions for a designer is to decide what properties will be inheritable and what properties will be learnable and then what properties will be fixed. So you may say, okay, I fixed the number of fields, it's always two, so it's not inheritable and not learnable, but I decide, this is my, this is my decision, I postulate that the neural network topology and the weights are learnable. They can change during the lifetime of a robot. And I also postulate uh, that the sensory makeup, how many cameras and where, it cannot change during the lifetime of the robot. If I decide this, then I also decide and determine where the learning operators work and where the evolutionary operators work. And then your question comes in, yes, but this, this doesn't work. Of course, you cannot have a reproduction operator on, 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 on this part. Now, that's the whole idea. We would like to have that uh, on that part. But before we go there, let me quote just one study among a, a lot that we have been doing in simulation, in virtual world. So this is a very trivial virtual world. It has inhabitants that can be animals or plants. And the animals have energy and they gain energy by eating the plants. So they gain energy like, I don't know, plus G is the energy gained by eating a plant, the good plant. And then animals lose energy by executing actions and actions could be like moving or beating another animal or mating another animal or, you know, fighting, anything. And they can eat bad plants, so eating a bad plant reduces the energy. So you can play around with the system parameters, equating G and B, or you could say it's a very hard word, mistakes are not easily forgiven, so B is twice G or ten times G, and then you pose a different challenge to these inhabitants. And in all our systems, this is a very important part, uh, which is, and this is a deviation from classic evolution computing. We use something which I call natural reproduction. You all know natural selection. And natural reproduction is that the mating decisions are not done by an overseeing entity, but by the individuals, the agents, the animals, or the robots themselves. Classic evolution computing fixes the population size, 100, and then there is an algorithm which, you know, does 100 times the fitness evaluation and the selection and the recombination and the survival selection, and in the second generation you will have 100 again. So birth and death are synchronized. In our system they are not, and therefore uh, the population size can change. Population can shrink or grow depending on uh, what happens, uh, number of births, number of deaths. And we also postulate that we have no quantified fitness function. We are, we are not optimizing anything. In the robots I showed you, in the lab we do. The yeah, number of bumps must be minimal and then obstacle avoidance have, uh, has been learned. But in these kind of systems there is nothing to optimize. So we are judging the system by looking at the population size. And it's our human judgment that we say big is good and stable is good, okay? So there are, there are many animals around and there, is no, there are not many catastrophes. <coughs> One of the studies looked into the development of the brain and the body in a very simple system. <coughs> there were just six traits, one for the gender or sex, and the two body, uh, bodily traits, uh, one we call the muscle mass, and if you had more muscle you could, you know, you could beat another animal with more force, and Skin thickness, if you, were, if you had a thick skin, then you were slower, but then you could handle bigger blows. And two behavioral traits, so your preference for fighting, your preference for mating, no, mating, or the preference for eating. And the very question was, what happens to the system if we evolve the bodies and change the, the way the minds are adapted, evolution or lifetime learning? And a very interesting outcome uh, that we received. So if you look at the, these two curves, this is not very surprising, but something we didn't know beforehand. Evolution plus evolution leads to a system where, you know, it's a happy system. After some initial stage, you get uh, large populations which are stable. If you do learning on the minds, you get this system. So you could say this is not that good at all. But the most interesting thing is this. In the body space, which had two parameters, these two systems converge to completely different segments. So this is the plot of the population 
under evolution plus evolution and this is the plot under evolution learning. The amazing thing is that the operators for the body were the same. Okay, so uh, the different way of adapting minds implied different bodies. So this was something very interesting and it asked for more research which we didn't really do back then. But this raises the question, how realistic is this? We have learned something, but we have learned something about what? We have, have we learned something about life on Earth? About artificial life? About uh, something even more general? Life as it could be anywhere in the universe? Or, that's my take, we have learned about this particular simulator. And there is the question whether this is an artifact of the simulator or not. So the only way to go around this is that you recognize that matter matters. It's really important, if you are looking into morphological properties or the body of that intelligence, you have to put it in the physical reality. And for this, I would like to quote and credit uh, Joe Long, an evolutionary biologist from the US, uh, the Wasser College, who wrote a beautiful pop science book called Darwin's Devices, about his experiments to check some biological hypothesis about the evolution of vertebrae. And he built robots and put them in water tanks and, you know, it was a very tedious, very slow process, but he got some data uh, and he could decide about his hypothesis. And what he said was, we can build software models of evolution, but we could also build hardware models of evolution. And a software model may be biologic, biologically uh, implausible, but also physically implausible. So it has two big sources of errors. If you make a hardware model, at least you won't have the second one. It may not be biologically plausible, but physically it will be okay, because it is physical. So there is no artifact or bias uh, in the system. If you learn something in that system, you really learn something about uh, physical life. So this brings me to my slide and my take on major transitions. So this is how Jim and me plotted the major transitions of the very concept of evolution over centuries. And Darwin's concept of evolution was an explanatory concept. In hindsight, it explained a process that took place already in the 18th century, no, 19th century. And it was a concept of evolution in wetware, in the biosphere. In the 20th century, we built computers and thereby we opened up the possibility to do uh, evolutionary simulations in software. So this was the first major transition from wetware to software. And I'm working on making the second major transition in the 21st century from software to hardware. So going from in silico to in material. And we had a name for this, evolution computing, and we introduced the name for this, that would be the evolution of things. So this would be the, the big taxonomy and the second major transition of the concept of evolution as distinguished by the, the, the substrate where it works. In particular, the specific ambition is to build robotic systems that are capable of reproduction, so self-reproducing robots, evolution. And in this case, we will have variation Morphologies will be inheritable and not learnable. We don't want robots go to the gym and, you know, get more muscles, but we want robots inherit morphological traits. And controller uh, traits will be learnable and inheritable. And the learning could happen in a supervised or an unsupervised uh, manner, and it could be done individually and socially, and or socially. And as for selection, so there is good news in a physical system, you don't have to bother about selection because it's there, you get it for free. The noise is for free and the challenges are for free. If a robot cannot recharge itself in time, it will just die. If a robot cannot meet another robot to reproduce, then it will die without, without offspring. And here we can distinguish two very important cases. In one case, uh, oops, we only consider fitness for the environment. It's always there. And sometimes, depending on the experiment or the user, we can have a task. So we could have fitness fit for purpose. We can feed, we can add the to this to the system and then we will evolve robots for doing something good or something very well. And in 
This system, the most intriguing aspect for me is the co-evolution of the mind and the body, or maybe the, the, the joint evolution of the mind and the body. And some of you may have read or heard about uh, this, again, beautiful book of uh, Pfeiffer and Bongard called how the, uh, body, no, how the Body Shapes the Way We Think. And the short version is How the Body Shapes the Mind. And with the technology, we can invert this question and we can investigate how the mind shapes the body, because the body has become shapeable now. Or if you are a clear thinker, then you could say how they shape each other under certain environmental conditions, and how the result depends on the environmental conditions. So, in this vision, in this research vision, there are a couple of essential distinguishing aspects. It must be physical uh, evolution, embodied in, in real objects, tangible objects. It will be morphological evolution, in not only the brains, the software, but also the, the construction, the bodies and the morphology will evolve. And it should be online autonomous evolution in the wild. It could be under human supervision, if for nothing else, just to observe the system. But we want the human out of the loop, so that the robots will be capable of evolving themselves on Mars or wherever. So this brings up the big question, is this possible? Can robots evolve? And if you think back of what evolution is, it only needs uh, reproduction and selection. And you remember that selection is for free. It, if, if you put it in real hardware, then it boils down to the question, can robots reproduce? And then in common parlance, can robots have children? So this was the idea a couple of years ago, and uh, this is a bit of a history of how it is developed. So in 2011, I gave a TED talk uh, in which I outlined the vision uh, without knowing much about the uh, feasibility of it all. Two years later, with a couple of um, very good roboticists and alive people, we developed a model for this kind of systems, a conceptual framework or a system architecture, which we uh, called the Triangle of Life. Uh, the ACAL paper is called the Triangle of Life, evolving robots in real time and real space. Two years later, Jim and me wrote this nature paper about uh, trans the transition from evolution computation to the evolution of things, which put it in a big historical context. And again, two years later, or one to two years later, we got some internal money for a proof of concept project uh, on the university, which we call the Robot Baby Project. And last week, our paper came out in the Artificial Life Journal, uh, which is the scientific account of what we did and how it all worked out. This is not the end of the story, this is just the very, very beginning of the story, obviously, so I tell you uh, about the details. The Triangle of Life is a generic framework which decomposes a universal life cycle, and the life cycle doesn't go from birth to death, it goes from conception to conception, that's why it's a cycle. And it provides guidelines for implementation, and it also defines a class of systems. Systems that follow this architecture are you know, a kind of systems, and that's our uh, subject of study. This is the triangle, so it starts as a cycle, you could start anywhere, but I think it's useful to start here. Conception is, you know, the existence of a piece of genetic code, DNA, if you wish, if you will. And then it will be converted into a phenotype, so the genotype becomes a phenotype, delivering a robot according to those specifications. And then there's a very important stage here, an infancy stage, a learning stage. A robot has to acquire elementary skills to survive and do stuff in that world. And only then it is postulated to be fertile. We don't want to waste resources, so we don't want bad stuff reproduce and have children. This, is why the, this step is very important. And then after being fertile, it can go around and do whatever they do. Uh, in the real environment, the arena. So this is the conceptual framework. And this is an artist, oh yeah, okay, the ethics of it. So this is the point where some people get an uh, uncanny feeling. You really want to do, make robots that will just reproduce out in the wild, so there will be so many of them and they will be hostile or poisonous or whatever. Uh, I want my children play in the park, but uh, if the robots are around, I won't. So ethics. Indeed, um, as every uh, responsible scientists, I'm thinking about the consequences, and we know about uh, nuclear hazard, we know about biohazard, we don't know much about robo-hazard yet, but 
it's a rounded wheel here and as for me building such a system requires a kill switch so there must be a way to stop the system somehow and there is a kill switch in this system this is an artist impression i paid an artist uh, some amount of money to make a drawing of it and here you see all the system components so this is the birth clinic this is where you know the transition from genotype to phenotype takes place this is the nursery where the baby robots are you know learning the elementary skills and uh, this is the fertility test if they pass they can come into the arena and because we want to have an ecosystem there is recycling and because we want to have uh, scientific uh, studies we have observation facilities around and it may have occurred to you these pieces of red meat here, these are the robots. So these are not mechatronical robots, but soft robots, soft bodied robots. So this is the idea and uh, during the writing of the A-Life paper we were uh, requested not to use these very popular terms. So uh, I still may say birth clinic, but I, what I really mean is production center. And I, I may say nursery, but I mean the training center. And this is the kill switch here. Because by decision, by, by very fundamental design decision, we don't want to have the robotic equivalents of pregnancy. And we don't want to have the robotic equivalents of eggs, because they represent a distributed reproduction system. We want to have the robotic equivalent of a birth clinic or a training center. There's just one single point where baby robots can be made. And from the robot's perspective, it's a single point of failure. For us, it's the kill switch. If we shut that down, evolution stops because there will be no more baby robots. And then we can, you know, collect the robots one by one, but at least after shutting down the system, they won't evolve anymore. So this was the drawing, and now this is what the robots have become. So the Robot Baby Project started with finding a good design space. And we are really indebted to Josh Auerbach and his Robogen system because we talked to him and we adopted his system, meaning that um, this is exactly how he designed it. Robots are composite entities of blocks, 3D printed blocks and some uh, prefabricated servo motors and cameras and light sensors and wires and uh, for us a Raspberry Pi and some battery. So this is the design space. This, uh, everything that can be constructed here is a possible body and all possible control software uh, pieces are possible brains here. So this is what we started with, and the project had only one goal, start with two robots and finish with three. In a way that you can really say that you, uh, you went through the life cycle. Okay, so uh, here you see the two robots that we built first, and the blue one is called uh, the spider, and the green one is called the gecko. So we started with a gecko and a spider, and this is what we ended with. Here you see the first family in the arena, uh, this is the baby. So what they did, uh, they underwent a learning process monitored by an, uh, an overhead camera, which the only thing to learn was walk. Walk to this corner, red laser lights, and the pure fact that you are there makes you fertile. So if at the moment they both were there, they were fertile and they were allowed to exchange their genetic material. And then we had good old crossover operator from genetic programming that produced a new piece of code and that's, and then delivery, uh, then the process of, uh, uh, on the 3D printer started. So the blocks were printed and then the PhD student put them all together according to the plan in the DNA. And then when this, robot was constructed, we finished. That was the birth of the first robot baby. And as you see, this is why we introduced colors. You can see how and where uh, the components come from. And you can also see, very nice for you, it's, it's obvious for many people not, this is a mutation. The white color was not present in the parents and it is present in the child. So there's, there you see some mutation has happened. So in the A Life paper, we describe this uh, and we also explain what kind of oversimplifications we had to make in order to have this work, and it does work indeed. And we also compare our experiments on gate learning in baby robots in simulation and gate learning in the baby robots uh, in the real hardware as we saw, as you saw it. And it's bad news. 
there is a big difference. So these are the simulated results, and whatever it is, the quality uh, is on this axis, so big is good, small is bad. So this is what you get in simulation, and this is what you get in real hardware. This is the Gecko and the, and the Spider. So this is, we know about the reality gap already, and it's, maybe it's not bad news, it's another confirmation that matter matters. If you really want to have a system behaving well, then you have to develop it in hardware. You have to have it developed in hardware, actually. And we discuss uh, several extensions of it. So where will this lead to? To some new kind of evolutionary robotics, as opposed to uh, evolutionary robotics as we know it and everybody does it now. It's all in the computer simulations. Every now and then some people evaluate a controller or a physical robot, but it's the huge majority of evolutionary robotics papers is about evolving the brains only and all in simulation. Some papers do fitness evaluations on real robots, and some papers address evolving morphologies, but definitely not the combination. So here you get something new, and as you already know, evolution is not entirely, or doesn't need to be a process without humans. We know something called breeding, and that is effectively manipulating evolution by manipulating one of the two basic operators. Not the variation operators, but the selection operators. That's what breeding is. And that's a step aside, it's an interesting ethical question. If manipulating selection, read breeding, is ethically okay, then tweaking around is variation, read genetical manipulation, why is that not okay? From evolutionary perspective, you have two forces and you know you can change both. Anyway, here we can have completely humanless evolution, for instance, for terraforming on some other planet. But we also can have robot breeding farms where under human supervision robots are evolving, just like uh, different uh, kind of dogs and sheep have been evolved for, uh, for human purposes. So at this moment, uh, we already have the setup, we have quite some simulation experiments, we have simula uh, a very good simulator, and we have some hardware. And at the very moment there are a couple of PhD students working on different research issues. So one of them is gate learning. The challenge here is that each and every baby robot differs from the parents. Okay? So the number of limbs, the length of the limbs, uh, lots of uh, body uh, traits will be different. So what we need is an algorithm that is capable of learning a gate quickly for a new morphology. And literature in, about gate learning in robots, like robots or uh, like robots, typically considers just one morphology, and they optimize the algorithm for that morphology. But for that, for us, that's not enough. And then sex partner recognition. The same story again. If each robot is different from the previous robots, then how do you recognize another robot? By design decision, we require that two robots can only mate if they are close to each other. So we don't have a pen metric system. They have to approach each other and that's a parameter, whether it is 30 centimeter or 50 or a meter, doesn't matter, but there is a limit. So they have to distinguish robots from other ob uh, objects in the environment and they have to approach each other, otherwise they won't have offspring. So this is, uh, this is quite a challenge. And then the combination of the two is directed locomotion. They have to go there. I will tell you later, we don't have recharging at the moment, so if uh, a robot drops dead, then we change the battery by hand, but uh, in a new system we want to have that. And then uh, directed locomotion will also be for foraging and not only for um, mating. Lamarckian evolution, uh, you are the biologist, I'm not, but as far as I know, Lamarck was wrong. So there is, uh, our, our evolution is not Lamarckian. But of course, this is no reason not to do it in robots. So if we can implement it, we can just do it. And sure enough, it works. So there is a paper coming in the A-Life conference in October or November? September. 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 Uh, where, we where we present these results. So the results are interesting. If some of the uh, controllers are not only learnable but also inheritable, then the system learns much quicker. So it is really worth making evolution uh, Lamarckian here. And just started a 
a project about uh, an epigenetic system. So uh, it was new, and in evolutionary computing is really something very, uh, very rare. But you know probably better than I, I do is if the epigenetic system means that the expression of genes, and for us it's morphological traits, but also behavioral traits, will depend on the environment. So these are the running research tracks. PhD students are working on it approximately in this order, so the results will come also approximately in this order. Upcoming research issues. If we had much money, if somebody gave us that bloody EU uh, uh, grant that we asked for, then we could and would do an awful lot of improvements in the system. In the production center, we would have much better and much more interesting morphologies, you know, uh, better sensors, maybe soft materials, maybe um, uh, memory alloys, uh, more actuators, quicker production. It would be really cool if we had a 3D printer that can produce a functional robot in one go, so that we don't have the handwork, or combine some other robot which is only putting together the baby robot. And we know Volkswagen can build a car in 20 minutes or something, so this is not rocket science, it's just too expensive for us uh, uh, academics, but it could be done. And if we could do that, then we had automated or more automated production, so the, the robot children would really come out of this um, production center automatically without info, uh, human involvement. In the training center, we will have more skills. We only teach the learning skills down the supervision, but there are so many more skills that the robot should, you know, related to vision, related to the task perhaps that you want uh, the robots to uh, do. And then the question is, what's the best way? Sequentially, scaffolding, a good order, or all in parallel? And the literature is not clear about this, there are papers about uh, both. Intellect social learning, in, in this, in this um, training center, it's possible to store everything that has ever been found and learned uh, there, and then when you release the fertile robot into the uh, arena, you could still keep the knowledge. So this will be indirect social learning by maintaining a kind of repository or library. So it's not in the same generation, but because each and every robot will have to pass this stage of the system, this part of the system, it's an easy uh, and quite natural way to keep that knowledge and then, you know, make, uh, make learning easier for the following generations. And of course we will have to have fertility tests, fertility tests, so at the moment getting to the red light is enough, then they can mate, but we will have to have good tests, automated tests that can judge the skills of the robots. Is, it good, is this robot good enough to be released and is it really good enough to have offspring? And as for in the arena, yeah, uh, the anything and everything can happen depending on what kind of habitat they have to live in and if they have to do anything useful or just have to live and, and survive. But then we will have unsupervised learning, so there is no reason to stop learning once you become a grown-up, but there will be no supervision around there. Or it must be coming from other robots, so it could be teacher robots, and Julian's idea is doing some reputation-based systems, robots that are very uh, well adapted to the environment and or the task, they may have more authority and other robots will be more inclined to listen to them. And for me, very interesting angle is sexual selection based on observable features, so that the robots can observe each other's features, uh, by a camera, for instance, and then make sexual preferences based on what they see. And then we can have lots of uh, experiments where we try to tweak a system and then build a little bit of a bias for being big. Uh, big is beautiful. Or for a certain color, or whatever you know, morphological feature that we can think of, and then see if that gets reinforced and it gives us uh, a certain kind of, a trend towards a certain kind of robots. And the sexual selection, not by robots themselves, but by users, users that will be the breeding, and of course the two can be combined. And on system level, adding the foraging and recharging uh, would be a great step forward, because uh, at this moment the autonomy of the robots is like two hours. So this is not much for evolution. If you want to have it running like for a month, then the robots will have to recharge themselves. And again, it's not rocket science, you know, my, my vacuum cleaning robot back home can do that, 
But these robots are a little bit different. So it has different bodies, different morphologies, and that will be quite a challenge. <coughs> We want to try systems with and without predefined tasks. So uh, the predefined task is interesting because it will give you robots that are doing something useful. Otherwise, you get a very biological system. I have some biggest research questions. So here's a list of research questions. I will just elaborate on one or two. You can make a whole PhD study or maybe a whole career on some, on some of these questions. For instance, number two, are there attractors or clusters in a morphology space, like a species, we will get zebras or we will, we will get birds. Are there attractors and clusters in the behavior space, which would be like culture, certain behavior which is reinforced, it doesn't have to have a meaning, but if a certain group of robots shows a behavior, you could say so maybe it's some emergent culture. And how will diversity develop? So on Earth we had the Cambrian explosion, all these species, you know, occurred and appeared on Earth. In an evolutionary system, artificial evolution system, diversity always dis disappears. The system converges to somewhere. So there is some big difference between the two. And I really wonder what happens if the system is physically uh, embedded. Will it be type life or will it be type genetic algorithm? So what kind of applications do you have? We can have breeding, uh, breeding farms for robot foresters or uh, robots that do uh, seafloor mining. We could have medical nanorobots in the human or animal body that would do some virus scanning, you know, patrolling for germs and, and cancer. We could have terraforming on completely uh, unreachable uh, planets, or we could have entertainment. Jurassic Park didn't go very well, we know that, but we could have a robotic park, and we could, you know, teaching and entertaining uh, children about evolution. As for science, let me quote uh, an evolutionary biologist whom you all know, I guess. Uh, John Maynard Smith said, so far we have been able to study only one evolving system and we cannot wait for interstellar flight to provide us with a second. If you want to discover generalizations about evolving systems, we have to look at artificial ones. So by this technology, we create a new research instrument. If you want to study the stars, you build a telescope. If you want to study particles, you build a cyclotron. If you want to study evolution, you build an evosphere. And it has two sides to the story, so it will be for the practical side, the roboticists who just want to build something that works, it will be a very good engineering tool. For the scientists who want to understand how real life works, it will be a tool, uh, a tool of uh, study. And because it will be a very complex and very expensive uh, device, I can imagine that we'll be working on a time-sharing basis, a, bit, a little bit like CERN, you can buy some, some uh, research time for it. And I cannot help but comparing this somehow crazy vision of trying to build machines uh, that can reproduce, reproducing machines, to those guys who were dreaming about flying machines. And they couldn't argue for the societal relevance and you know, the industry 4.0 or whatever. So they didn't do that because they foresaw that there will be a whole industry without which I wouldn't be standing here today. <laughs> but they dreamed about it and, you know, it, in four, 500 years it became something really major. So now we are at that very stage, so our, this design is very crappy, it is very simple, very elementary, but it could grow out to something which we still cannot imagine, but it will be something very much, very much like life. Life, but not as we know it. Thank you. <laughs>